Hello class, welcome to a another STAT 211 lecture. Today we're going to be talking about the standard deviation as a ruler and the normal model. So in this lecture we are going to have three objectives. We're going to start by learning how to use the standard deviation to standardize values. Then we're going to talk about shifting and scaling before ending this lecture with the normal model. Let's get started. To begin, let's start with a motivating example. Suppose we have two students who are applying to the same college. Their applications are virtually identical in quality, GPA, extracurricular, extracurricular activities, etc. The major difference between these students is that student A took the ACTs while student B took the SATs. Student A received a 21 on the ACTs and student B received an 1150, and we'll assume it's out of the traditional 1600 on the SAT. Based on this, how can we tell which student is the better student to admit? The way we do this is actually by standardizing the scales. In other words, expressing a distance from the mean and standard deviations standardizes performance. To standardize a value, we subtract the mean and then divide the difference by the standard deviation. The values created are called standardized values. So basically what we're doing is even though we have two different things from our motivating example, ACT and SAT scores, by standardizing the values, we can convert these different tests to be on the same scale. We do this specifically with something called the Z-score. So we let X be a value from a population with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. The z-score is z equals x minus mu divided by sigma. Again, the population mean is mu and the population standard deviation is sigma. Standardized values are commonly denoted with the letter z and again, we're going to call these z-scores. The z-score of an individual data value tells us how many standard deviations that value is from its population mean, meaning how close that data value is to the mean. For example, a data point with a z-score of 1 means that the data point is 1 standard deviation above the mean. A data point with a z-score of negative 2 means that the data point is two standard deviations below the mean. In statistics, positive and negatives don't have the same connotation as they do out in the real world, where positive is good, negative is bad. For us, positive and negatives tend to be meaning or have the meaning of directionality. So positive means that it was um, above the mean, negative, below the mean. It's the relationship to the mean, not good or bad. So why do standardizing values help us at all? Kind of already clued you in, but let's take a look, look again with our original example. So we can recall student A received a 21 on the ACT and student B received an 1150 on the SAT. Using the z-score for the students, we can directly compare these two scores and determine the better student. By, by using z-scores, we can convert them onto the same scale and determine which z-score is further above the average would indicate which student scored better overall. So say that year, the average score on the ACT was 20.8 with a standard deviation of 0.5 and the average score on the SAT was 1060 with a standard deviation of 50. Using our z-score formula, student A scored, again, they scored a 21. The average was 20.8 and the standard deviation was 0.5. Using our z-score formula, we can plug in 
and get the z-score. So student A scored 0.4 standard deviations above the mean. Student B, if we can recall, scored an 1150 on their SATs in a year where the average score was 1060 and the standard deviation was 50. Using our z-score formula, we can subtract and divide and get a z-score for student B, which was 1.8. So student B scored 1.8 standard deviations above the mean. Meaning, student A had a score, z-score of 0.4, meaning they were 0.4 standard deviations above the average ACT score. Student B's z-score of 1.8 meant that they scored 1.8 standard deviations above the average SAT score. So assuming that the same caliber of students take SAT and ACTs, the population understanding should be similar. So to compare their respective averages, student B is the better student to commit admit to the college because student B scored further above the average. So let's talk more about how we can understand z-scores. The z-score measures the distance of the value from the mean and standard deviations. We can almost think of standard deviations like a unit of measure, the same way we think of inches. A positive z-score, again, indicates that the value is above the mean. A negative z-score indicates the value is below the mean. Again, this, is, this positive and negative doesn't necessarily have bad and good connotations. It's all locational. There are times where having a z-score below the mean could actually be good, something good. A small z-score indicates that the value is close to the mean when compared to the rest of the data values. A large z-score indicates the value is far from the mean when compared to the rest of the data values. So someone with a small z-score scored close to the average. Someone with a large z-score scored further away from the general population average. I know the terms large and small don't have exact meanings, and where would the cutoff be for that? And we'll talk about specifically what that means later, but for now, for your understanding, um, anything between a z-score of negative 2 to positive 2 should be considered small, and anything less than negative 2 or greater than positive 2 should be considered large. Again. We'll discuss the theory behind the large and small z-scores later in the lecture, but right now we can leave it as between negative 2 and 2 is small. Anything greater than those values, or I should say more extreme, is considered large. I really want to focus right now on calculating z-scores and the interpretation. So first practice question, what does it mean to have a z-score of negative 1.75? That means that we have a z-score of negative, or rather not negative, we have a z-score of 1.75 standard deviations below the mean. Let's take a look at another question. Suppose you scored 94 on your stat test. The mean score was 84 with a standard deviation of 5.2. So what was your z-score? So we can recall z equals x minus mu divided by sigma. x is what our unique score, so our value of interest, in this case your 94, minus the mean, which was 84, divided by the standard deviation of 5.2. Now it's time for our calculators. Remember, we subtract before we divide in this kind of problem. So 94 minus 84 
divided by 5.2. This gives us a z-score of 1.92. When it comes to rounding, we generally go to two decimal places for z-scores. What does this z-score mean? It means that you scored 1.92 standard deviations above the mean, meaning you did better than the average student by 1.92 standard deviations. Let's take a look at another one. Suppose Steve from Blue's Clues fame is concerned about Blue's weight. Any imaginary dog that is 2.5 standard deviations above average is considered overweight. The average imaginary dog of Blue's breed weighs 7.7 .7 pounds with a standard deviation of 1.2 pounds. At what weight would Blue be considered overweight? So let's think about this. We know Z, our Z score, equals X minus mu divided by sigma. We were told that the average is 7.7 .7 and the standard deviation was 1.2. Any imaginary dog that is 2.5 standard deviations above the average is considered overweight. So in a change of events, we were actually given the z-score. And using our formula, we can find x. Calculator time. So I'm going to multiply 2.5 times 1.2 and then add the 7.7, .7, leaving me with x equal to 10.7. So at what weight would blue be considered overweight? That would be 10.7 pounds. So anything more than that, blue might be having overweight or might be overweight. All right, let's do another one. The average on the first stat exam is 70 with a standard deviation of 10. For the second exam, the average was 80 with a standard deviation of 5. Alex scored a 75 on both exams, while Mary scored a 70 on the first exam and 80 on the second. Who scored better overall? So this kind of is reminiscent of our motivating example when we were comparing someone with an SAT score and an ECT score. So for us, I'm going, to add a, I'm going to add a blank page for us to work on. What we're going to do is compare the z-scores and see which students did better overall, either Mary or Alex. So we'll start with Alex. So we've got exam one. and then exam two. So for Alex, on the first exam, he scored a 75. The average for that exam, if I recall, I think it was 70 and 10, yes. The average was 70 and the standard deviation was 10. So quick z-score calculation, 75 minus 70 divided by 10. So he scored 0.5 standard deviations above the mean for the first exam. Now let's take a look how Zach did on the second exam. 
So on the second exam, Alex scored a 75 again. This time, the average was an 80 with a standard deviation of 5. Calculator time, 75 minus 80 is negative 5 divided by 5, which is negative 1. So on the second exam, Zach scored one standard deviation below the average. So he did a little bit worse on this second exam than he did on the first one. Now let's take a look at Mary. Once again, for both these, the average and standard deviation are going to be the same. On the first exam, Mary scored 70, and on the second exam, she scored 80. For the first exam, let's calculate Mary's z-score. 70 minus 70 is 0, divided by 10, 0. For her second exam, 80 minus 80, 0, divided by 5, 0. So on both of these exams, Mary scored exactly at the average. So let's determine how or whether who did better overall in these exams. So for Alex, we're just going to add the z-scores of both of his exams. So he did 0.5 on the first one and got a negative 1 on the second. So combining that, that's negative 0.5. For Mary, she scored 0 both times for a z-score, which equals 0. 0 plus 0 is 0. So comparing, it looks like Mary did better overall in comparison to Alex. He may have done better on the first exam, but he did significantly worse on the second one, and that brought him down. All right, so now that we've talked about z-scores and things like that, let's move over to talk about shifting and scaling. When you convert data values into a z-score, what you're really doing is you are shifting by the mean and scaling by the standard deviation. Shifting the data occurs when you add or subtract the same value from every value in the distribution. So for example, if we add five to every value in x. When we shift things, this affects the measures of center, mean, median, and mode. But what it doesn't do is it does not affect the measures of spread, standard deviations, IQR, range, things like that. In a way, I like to think of this as almost like a battleship where I can shift my, ba my boat to diff different locations on the grid. The boat itself doesn't change shape, but I can move its location. So think of the location as measures of, of center, spread is the actual size of the boat. So I can just shift my boat around. Let's take a look at an example of this. So suppose we have a small fake data set with four, three, six, nine, and 15. Suppose we wanna shift by two, what happens to our summary statistics? So, if we add two to every observation in our data set, so four becomes six, three becomes five, six becomes eight, nine becomes 11, and 15 becomes 17, we can then calculate the summary statistics and see what happens.
So our var1 is our first column, our original data set. So notice the mean was 7.5, the variance was 23.3, the median was 6, and the range was 12. Now look at our shifted data set. Notice the mean is now 9.4. We literally shifted our mean by 2. If we look at the variance and standard deviation, they stayed the same. The median, that also got added by 2, but the range also stayed the same. So measures of center were increased by 2 because we shifted by 2, but the measures of spread stayed the same. Let's talk about scaling. Scaling the data occurs when you multiply or divide the same value from every value in the, dis in the distribution. So for example, if we multiplied every val value by five. When we scale something, it affects the measures of center and the measures of spread. Remember, when we scale, only the measures of center are affected when we Sorry, when we shift, only the measures of center are affected. When we scale, everything is affected. If you think how I mentioned the battleship, where when we shift, we're just moving that ship around, but we're not changing its overall shape. When we scale, we are not, not only are we like moving its location, but really we're also ma either magnifying or shrinking the ship. That's what happens when we scale. Let's take a look. Using a small fake data set, still with 4, 3, 6, 9, and 15, suppose we scale by 3. Let's see what happens. So we're going to multiply each observation by 3. So 4 becomes 12, 3 becomes 9, 6 becomes 18, 9 becomes 27, and 15 becomes 45. Our first, looking at our summary statistics, our VAR1 is still our original data set. So mean of 7.4, variance 23.3, and so on. Take a look now at our scale data set. Notice the change. In every case, it has gotten larger. We've magnified it. In fact, if we look at that measure of the mean, 7.4 times 3 is 22.2. 6 times 3, 18. 12 times 3, 36. And again, times 3, we have literally just magnified our data set. Let's take a look at a practice problem. Sometimes it is necessary to convert between temperatures in Fahrenheit and Celsius. In general, we can use the following formula where Celsius equals 5 ninths times the temperature in Fahrenheit minus 32. Suppose the average temperature in San Francisco is 65 degrees with a standard deviation of 5.1 degrees, all in Fahrenheit. What would be the corresponding mean and standard deviation in Celsius? All right, so on our next slide, I'm going to go ahead, recopy. So we have 5 ninths multiplied by F minus 32. We are given that the mean in San Francisco is 75. No, sorry, I think 65. Yes, 65 degrees 
and our standard deviation was 5.1. Shifting and scaling. So on the surface, we're going to easily just plug into our formulas. But we're going to see quickly, it's actually going to get a little more complicated than that. So for the mean, 5 ninths multiplied by 65 minus 32. In parentheses, 65 minus 32 multiplied by the 5 ninths, which gives us 18.3 degrees Celsius. Now that is correct, but I want to pause and say why it's correct. When we are shifting and scaling, the mean is always affected. So the mean will be affected if we subtract values and if we multiply values. So it's fully okay to plug our average right into the formula and chug it out. With the standard deviation though, if we recall, Standard deviations are not affected by shifting. So this add, the subtract 32 does not affect our standard deviation. So we actually get to eliminate that part because the standard deviation should be unaffected. Instead, all we have to do is multiply 5.1 by the five nines. So our new standard deviation in Celsius is 2.83. So again, our mean and standard deviation in Fahrenheit was 65 degrees and 5.1 degrees Fahrenheit. In Celsius, that becomes 18.3 degrees Celsius for our mean and our standard deviation is 2.83 degrees Celsius. Excellent. So how does this relate to Z-score? Well, once again, really what happens whenever we are looking at a data value we are shifting the data by the mean and then we scale it by the standard deviation. When we subtract the mean of the data from every data value, what happens is we then shift the mean to be zero. But again, when we shift things, the measures of center change but standard deviations, measures of spread, do not. So all we've done here in the numerator is convert it to a scale where the mean is zero. Then, after that, we get to divide each of these shifted values by our sample standard deviation. However, the standard deviation should be divided by the sample standard deviation as well. Since the standard deviation was the sample standard deviation to start with, that means the new standard deviation becomes 1. So thinking back to our discussions, I said when we use z-score, what we're doing is we're essentially moving them to be on the same scale. Literally, what we do when we're doing z-scores, we shift and scale our data set such that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. So regardless of what things started out with, when we use z-scores, we convert such that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. 
this enables us to compare across units of measure and so on. It is important to note that we aren't changing the overall shape of the distribution. We are just either magnifying, shrinking it, moving it from left to right, but the shape itself doesn't change. Visually, it looks something like this, which is called the normal model, which is about to be our next objective. So taking a look here, suppose we have SAT scores here at the bottom. Remember our previous example? Um, so 1150 here is our average in this year. Moving standard deviations, 1,850 and 700 to the left, and then our values to the right. Using z-score, all we're doing is we convert it to this z-score scale, where instead of the average being 1150, we've made it zero. And instead of our scales moving by 150, we, they can move by one. So the beauty of using z-scores is that it really can help us compare values based on these different scales. Um, we took a look at the situation where we were comparing ACT and SAT scores, we can even take this further. We can look at like who's the measure of, or who's a better track and field athlete. You know, jumpers, they get measured in distance, but runners, they're measured in time. These are totally different scales and measurements. But using Z-score, we can determine who did better than the overall average. Now, we're finally ready to talk about the normal model. Uh, this is something that is super important in statistics, so definitely pay attention here. So if you recall earlier in this lecture, I told you that anything between negative two and two should be considered small and anything more extreme than negative two and positive two should be considered large. And I said we'd later in the lecture talk about why that's true. Now we're here. So there was a French mathematician who discovered that for many unimodal and symmetric distributions, the following was true, that about 68% of the values fall within one standard deviation of the mean, and about 95% of the values fell within two standard deviations of the mean, and 99.7% of the values fell within three standard deviations of the mean. This became known as the 68-95-99.7 rule, also known as the empirical rule. So to show you what this looks like visually, so the normal model is the standard model we see out in nature, and it is unimodal and symmetric. Remember those histograms I told you you needed to be able to identify? This is why. It's being able to identify when samples are following the normal model, AKA unimodal and symmetric. So what has been noticed with populations that follow this curve is that about 68% of that data lies within one standard deviation of the mean. So 68% 68 68 of people, say IQ scores, are within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% of our data is within two standard deviations. And 99.7% of our data is within three standard deviations of our mean. So that idea of what is a small z-score and large z-score, well, since 95% of our data is within negative two and positive two standard deviations, we say, okay, that's normal. That's where 95% of our data is. If it's more extreme, so if it's less than negative two or greater than positive two, we're talking about something that only had a 5% chance of happening. So pretty small, pretty rare.
Now, of course, this notice observation isn't sufficient enough in statistics. Just looking at some sort of pattern, eventually we like to add math to it. So in 1809, Gauss figured out the formula for the distribution, aka model, that actually accounted for our French mathematician's observations. That model is now called the normal or Gaussian model. You'll pretty much only hear me refer to it as the normal model. So characteristics of this normal model, surprise, surprise, it is unimodal and symmetric. Technically, there is a different normal model for every mean and standard deviation. We represent mu, the Greek letter, to be the population mean. Sigma, the Greek letter sigma, represents the population standard deviation. Notation-wise, a capital N next to two parentheses is how we represent the normal model. The first value in our parentheses is going to stand for the population mean and the second value will be the population standard deviation so for example capital n parentheses 5 comma 0.5 says that we are dealing with a normal model that has a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 0.5 these notations are important to know and remember because we'll be using them quite a bit in this course. So let's talk about some more facts about the normal model. So again, we use two parameters to help specify our normal model, the mean and si or mu and sigma, AKA population mean and population standard deviation. When we're dealing with samples that we're trying to figure out, we use our sample statistics of a sample mean and a sample standard deviation. Whenever we're trying to use things like z-score and the normal model, remember they should only be used if our data is approximately symmetric and unimodal. Hence why, again, I was so on you guys looking at histograms and being able to determine whether they were unimodal or symmetric. That's why. Let's take a look at my previous hint of talking about track and field athletes. So suppose we want to compare two Olympic tra track athletes, a runner and a long jumper. The runner's speed was 21 seconds, with mu being 22.7 and sigma being 0.35. The long jumper's distance was 26 feet with a mean of 28.5 and a standard deviation of 1.4. So pretty easy, plugging in for z-score for our runner. Um, they scored 21, mean was 22.7, standard deviation was 0.35, giving us a z-score of negative 4.9. Let's think about that for a second, negative 4.9. Alarm bells should be going off in your head right now because negative 4.9, that is super rare. That is negative 4.91. That is 4.91 standard deviations below the mean. That is impressive. Let's take a look at the long jumpers. So they scored 626 feet, and again, the overall mean was 28.5, and the standard deviation was 1.4. 26 minus 28.5, all divided by 1.4, is negative 1.8. Okay, so if we're thinking normal model, we have our runner here and our long jumper more here. How can we tell who did better? Well, I want you to think about this. And this is why I said negative doesn't always mean bad. 
in running, we want to be fast. Smaller times are better. So even though this runner scored below the average, that means they scored faster. They ran faster. They did better than the average in this case. So if we're trying to compare this runner and the long jumper, this runner did really well. Really well. And as I've already shown you visually, z-scores are really just corresponding to the position of a data value in our standard normal distribution. The standard normal distribution is a special case of the normal distribution where mean is zero and standard deviation is one. Hence why we use z-scores. It converts whatever we're working with to this one special case, the standard normal. It can also be written as n and then parentheses zero comma one. So if we take a look back at our example we just did, our long jumper would be about here because their z-score was negative 1.8. And then way over here, we have our runner with their very extreme, very rare z-score, practically off the charts. So when we do these types of distributions, there's assumptions we have to work with. Basically, things we need to assume to be true in order to use the model and all its fun properties. So the 68, 99.7 rule works when the distribution is unimodal and symmetric. Otherwise, we can't use it. Hence why I keep mentioning unimodal and symmetric so many times, because if we have our data and we graph it onto a histogram and it's not unimodal and symmetric, or at least approximately so, it doesn't work. The normal model, like all models, makes assumptions. As a result, we do need to check these associated conditions in the data to make sure the assumptions are reasonable. Um, I know this sounds weird, but basically, in order to use the normal model, we need to assume that our distribution, our whole population, is actually normal, that it literally does follow the normal model. Uh, so one way we can do that is check with the histogram, make sure that histogram is unimodal and asymmetric, at least approximately so. Uh, another way we can do this is by checking out a QQ plot, also known as a normal quantile plot. I'll show you a little bit more about that later, but just so you know, you do have two options. But for now, we'll focus on the histogram. And the condition of this formally is known as the nearly normal condition. So if we take a sample, that sample needs to at least approximately behave normally. All right, so that does actually bring us to the end of today's lecture. As always, if you have questions, please send me an email. Have a great night.